Our virtual event today is an X Factor conversation with Len Kleinrock, a father of the internet. 51 years and one day ago, Dr. Kleinrock sent the first ever email message. During this session, he will speak with Karen Panetta, the 2019 IEEE HKN president and founder of Nerd Girls, about this historic event, the evolution of the internet, and what he is working on now. If you would like to post on Facebook about this event, please use the hashtag the Let's HKN enter this very special place. And that HKN machine over there X is the first 2020. piece of At internet this time, equipment. I'd like this to hand it over to Nancy Osten, director of Military IEEE art and machine. Academy. It has a unique odor. Thank you, Casey, and welcome. And it was from to here HKN that the experience. first message was sent. A revolution began. I'm so happy to have Dr. Kleinrock with us. Dr. Kleinrock is uh, at a Kaepernick member inducted in, um, to the College of New York a couple of years ago and one of our eminent members and really a good friend of Etta Kaepernick News. Um, I know it's going to be a fascinating conversation with our Karen Panetta, our 2019 president. So I'm going to give it right to Karen because we want to hear as much, spend as much time as possible with Dr. Kleinrock. Awesome. Thank you so much, Nancy and Stacy, and welcome, Dr. Kleinrock. We are honored to have you with us today. And it was a year ago that I was out with you in sunny California um, celebrating the Internet's birthday, the 50th anniversary, and you were on that stage with that giant computer and showing us the original machinery, which we were all impressed is still still, still being preserved, which is awesome. But let's jump right into it. We want to hear how you even got started in this, where the idea come from, you know, how did you even arrive at this? And give us a little bit about your own background of how you just went from undergraduate to choosing your graduate program and how you ended up working with one of the rock stars of information theory, Shard Clannon. Well, there's a lot to, to, lot to compose on that. <laughs> I think one characteristics I should point out is that my background, as you refer to, was an interesting mix of both physical application, hands-on, tear it apart machines, and good theoretical training in the university. Um, I would build things as a kid, all through college. I tore radios apart. I worked during the day when I went to school at night at City College. During the day, I was a, an engineer in an industrial electronics firm. So I was building things, designing things, and working with graduate engineers who taught me a great deal. At night, I'd go to school, and I'd get the theoretical work, the equations, the fundamentals, the phenomena, the principles. And that combination was somehow suited to where I wanted to be. I wanted to have both a physical, intuitive, experiential understanding on the one hand, and the theoretical, foundational stuff on the other hand. That, that characteristic basically has been what's driven the, the trajectory I've taken in my career. Not pure theory, not pure building applications, but the two because they feed each other. And you have capability in both areas. You know why you're doing what you're doing, and you know when you've succeeded because you actually try it out. So having said all that, when I got to MIT, um, basically I... Well, I got there on a fluke, as it turns out. Having gone to a night session at CCNY, um, I was told there was going to be a gentleman from MIT coming by offering this wonderful scholarship. He came by, I listened to him, and he said, at the end of a talk, see the professor in the back of the room, and he'll give you an application to apply for the scholarship. So after the talk, I went to the back of the room, saw this professor, he was an electrical engineering professor, mm -hmm. and I asked for an application. And he said... What's your name? I don't recognize you. And I gave him my name. I said, you won't recognize me because I go to evening session, not day session. He said, evening session, get the hell out of here. <laughs> <laughs> oh, so well, that, I just wanted you to know that that same feeling still exists today that, you know, part-timers get killed today. But we're hoping we need to change that. But, oh, thank you for that one. Oh, so well, how'd, you come, how'd, you, how'd you convince them otherwise that you were worth it? I didn't. I went around them. I wrote to MIT and got the application. It was the only one accepted. But there's a lesson here for the students out there in this audience, and that is don't accept things as they are. Find ways around difficulties. I mean, 
I'm sure every one of the people on listening here today has bumped into some serious hardships and problems. Mm-hmm. And there's two ways to deal with them. One is to sit in the corner and cry and collapse. And the other is to say, this is a wake up call. What is it trying to tell me? What do I have to change to make it work? So that's, I'm glad we were able to get that lesson in early in the discussion because it's, mm-hmm. it's important. Because once right. you succeed in any endeavor, be it a piece of poetry, building a radio, becoming an Eagle Scout, great piece of, great piece of art, once you succeed, you'll then have the confidence that you can do something just beyond your grasp mm-hmm. and you do it again throughout your career. You have to have that confidence of having experience at least once. So that's something to carry with you and cherish with you. But anyway, getting back to the details in MIT, I'm going to throw up a slide here. Um, to get started my research, um, when I was at MIT, I got my master's degree there, and then they, they forced me to get a PhD, which I didn't want, by the way. <laughs> I had a very fine job. I, was, I was, had a great research job at MIT. Um, I already had a child. I needed to earn full-time money. My professor said, you absolutely have to get a PhD. He said, well, look, if I'm going to do that, I've got two conditions. Condition number one, which is on the screen right now, I want to go and work for the absolutely best professor I know at MIT. And secondly, I want to work on something which will have impact and not some little piddly problem which will disappear in you know three weeks after I finish it. So I decided to go for the best. And that best was a gentleman you mentioned earlier, Claude Shannon. Look at that picture. That man, you can just see the, the power in it, just his pose and his, his, mm-hmm. his, his expression. Um, he created information theory. He created coding theory. He did all that work in 1948 and on. And he came to MIT and was teaching these courses to supervise some students. So all of the students he was working with were doing their PhD dissertation in those areas. It was the rage at MIT. All my classmates were there, but I, I recognized that Shannon had already done the fundamental, critical work, really laid it all out. And what was left were hard problems. And in my mind, they were not only hard, but they were small. And that's mm-hmm. not what I signed up for. So I decided to look to do something else. Mm-hmm. I wanted to find a problem with a lot of potential in an area nobody was looking at yet. And there was at MIT surrounded by computers. And I recognized sooner or later, they're going to have to talk to each other. And there was no adequate way for them to do that. So look, and the current technology wouldn't do it. So look, look at this problem. It was a fresh problem. It was an important one. It's one that would have impact. And I felt I saw a way to solve it. Did you have, to sell, what the critical... you have to sell your advisor on the idea or did he see it too? No, I, once I told him, he recognized there's a new area here which needs mm-hmm. work. But by the way, Shannon ended up being on my committee. He was not my supervisor, mm-hmm. but uh, his advice was unbelievable. Um, you'd walk into this man's office, this brilliant, world-renowned man. And what was he doing? He'd be sitting there with a differential gear in one hand and a Swiss Army knife in the other, and he'd be busy unscrewing the damn gear. I mean, (laughs) he was hands-on, literally. Mm -hmm. I mean, he he was a great juggler. He rode a unicycle around Bell Labs. Um, It it was amazing. So so he... He also dispelled the myth that engineers are nerds, right? Because we do, we are multi-talented. So it obviously driving a unicycle is, shows that. I mean, he, he was, the way I characterized before, a wonderful mix of mathematical brilliance, mm-hmm. theoretical excellence, and intuitive understanding of the way things work and should work. Mm-hmm. So when he looked at a problem, he could imagine what the answer was. He could then theoretically prove it. And it exposed principles that he was looking for. It was that combination you can't beat. And I recommend everybody here not to be pure mathematicians, theoreticians, mm-hmm. not to be pure uh, developers and, and builders, but that combination. And there's more to that story as well. But anyway, so I decided to do that. And uh, I set out. And um, basically, I, what I did is I set to uncover the principles of data networks, published the proposal, introduced the concept of packet switching, filed a PhD with a book, joined the faculty, and nobody cared. 
Nobody cared about this technology I developed. Not I even would go industry. to 18. Not, not even industry? Industry wasn't excited about it? In particular industry. I mean, who was the largest networking company at the time? AT&T. Mm -hmm. They had this wonderful voice network, which did a good job on voice. And I told them, look, you really ought to create a data network. And they said, look, it's not going to work. And even if it does work, we want nothing to do with it. Wow. And, and so, you know, I, he say, basically they said, little boy, go away. Mm -hmm. And little boy and his friends went away, and we took away the telephone industry from them. But, <laughs> but, but why did they say that? Mm -hmm. You know, looking back, it's very clear why they took that viewpoint. The voice network was a terrific gold mine for them. It was generating all kinds of revenue. It was lots of voice and not lots of need for it. At that point, computers weren't talking to each other. There was no data traffic, no need for such a network. So from a short range point of view, there was no business model. Mm -hmm. They should have been able to think forward and see there would be a business model, but corporations being what they are, even AT&T with this wonderful Bell Labs of wonderful, brilliant mm -hmm. innovation, couldn't see the value. And so it took until the uh, Department of Defense to ARPA decided they needed a network. Uh, that's a long answer to your short question. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs> That was a great question. Um, so let's talk about the, now. Now you've developed this. You're at UCLA. How, let's talk about what led up to that first message that you sent. And and I, I, I'd like to hear about the, um, you know you sending out with the message. And it wasn't the entire message before it crashed. And yet this was such a celebration where some students would say, oh, it didn't work 100% the way we anticipated fully, that's a failure. So talk a little bit about that. Okay, so the history is the Department of Defense decided they needed a network to connect together the research centers that they were supporting around the country. And so in the mid 60s, they, they decided to do that. Uh, my my iPad is talking back to me suddenly. <laughs> Siri heard me. Okay, so the the idea was um, they needed the network to connect together the centers. And by the way, I'm going to make a small digression here, Karen, to bring up another sure. important point that sure. says to me. You know, Sputnik went up in 1957, caught the United States with its pants down. President Eisenhower, in, within four months, created the Advanced Research Projects Agency to support research across the country to build back the United States capability. So they started funding research. And in the early 60s, they started funding computer research. And by the mid-60s, the period I mentioned just a moment ago, mm -hmm. they wanted to connect these sites together because everybody wanted all the capabilities everybody else had. Mm -hmm. um, but the point I want to make is the way they funded these research centers is a very important cultural uh, observation. They would go to a great researcher. Let's pick one like, say, Marvin Minsky, one of the fathers of artificial intelligence. They look, Marvin, you're a great researcher. Here's a pile of money. Go do something in your field that's really significant. Mm -hmm. In particular, uh, high, you know, high risk, high payoff. Mm -hmm. And uh, we're not going to watch you, and you're going to have the money for a long time. So what better way to fund somebody to do innovative, creative research? Mm -hmm. No constraints, plenty of resources. Mm -hmm. Now, what does a principal investigator like myself who receives that money, what are we going to do with the money? Mm -hmm. We're going to fund graduate students. And how do we do it? With that same wonderful go to a student and say, look, here's a problem. Go figure it out. Organize yourself. Come up with a solution. You want help? I'll help you if you need it. Failure is okay. Shoot high. Go bold. Mm -hmm. Now, that culture is what was driving the creation of what we now call the Internet in those early days. Mm -hmm. It was a golden era of innovation, unbridled innovation, where you, know, you could try anything, and you organize yourself into groups, you know, self-organized groups among graduate students and faculty. So as this was flourishing, and as they recognized there were great resources being developed across the country, they needed a network so that if I wanted to use graphics, and Utah was a central graphics center, I could log on through the network and use the graphics at Utah instead of having to recreate 
can reproduce all the graphics capabilities in my site. So now you're sharing so, resources, you're, you're expanding the capability because you're sharing so many resources and probably saving money in doing it because everybody doesn't have to replicate it. Well, well, exactly. That was the clear vision and the correct vision. However, mm -hmm. here we go again. Did anybody want to do that? You go to Utah. Utah is running a computer facility for its mm -hmm. local faculty and, and students. And, and Arthur and I go to them and say, look, we'd like you to connect your computer into this network so we can use it. They say, no way. We're using 100% of the cycles. Mm -hmm. You can't have, we say, but look, you're going to be able to use other people's. No way. Mm -hmm. Well, ARPA had to force them to join in the early days. So again, the second bump in the road, people didn't want this technology, which is so attractive and clear, if mm -hmm. they could just think one step ahead. Yep. Um, so ARPA put together a group of us, uh, the man in charge, one of my classmates at MIT, Larry Roberts, mm -hmm. he knew my work, and he actually said he would never have engaged in spending millions of dollars of the Amer America's money on this newfangled network unless he knew it would work. And mm -hmm. he says, because he knew my research, and I could prove the packets wouldn't fall on the floor, that there'd be sensible throughput and, and response times, he'd do it. So that we designed the network, we sent it out for bid, the industry to actually implement thing. Mm -hmm. A company called Bolper, Anik, and Newman in Cambridge, Mass was selected, and mm -hmm. they decided to make UCLA the first node because we had the expertise on the theory and the practical and the software side. Mm -hmm. We became the first. But finally, I'm going to answer your question. <laughs> um, the, that first switch, we called it an interface message processor, arrived at UCLA the Tuesday of the Labor Day weekend, September 2nd. We turned it on. But we were only one node. A month later, a second node was attached to the network. In fact, let me show you a picture of this so you can get an idea. Um, let me see. Look, it's right here. That, 1969. That second node, was at Stanford? So, well, I'm going to take you through it. Yes, it was at Stanford. Here we are. Be, be, suddenly, the imp arrived in September. Okay. That was the first router, the first piece of the switch. By the way, that's what it looks like. That's the thing you saw a year ago on the 50th anniversary page. It's a refrigerator size switch. <laughs> the capability is less than on my on my, my calculator watch that I carry around today. Um, that's a control panel. That's what it looks like inside. It's so mm -hmm. ugly, it's beautiful. That but that's what it was. Mm -hmm. A month later, up at Stanford Research Institute, in October, SRI had their imp, they connected it to their host, and that was the first link of the backbone network ever on the internet. And it was running at the blazing speed per second. Lightning now you probably speed. all <laughs> frightening speed, right? You laugh. You laugh now that it's fifty years later. Let me tell you, in those days that was broadband. Mm-hmm. Um, we decided to keep a log of what was going on. The most important entry is right here, and it says on October 29th, 1969, mm -hmm. we talked to SRI host to host at 10.30 at night, and the entry mm -hmm. is put there by Charlie Klein, my software student, who sent mm -hmm. the message itself. Uh, that's the connection, UCLA to SRI. And the question is, what was the first message you're referring to, Karen? Mm -hmm. Well... Most people don't know it. Was it something really good like telegraph message, what if God wrote? Or telephone message, come here, Watson, I need you? Or man on the moon, giant leap for mankind? Those guys were smart. They knew the <laughs> press, public relations. They had the cameras and the voice recorders when they were available. Um, we had no idea. We didn't have a good message. All we wanted to do was log in from UCLA to SRI. Mm -hmm. To do that, you have to type the L-O-G, and the re remote machine will type the I-N field. Mm -hmm. So that's the setup, same setup. But to be sure this damn thing was working, we had a telephone connection from Charlie here to Bill Duval up there at SRI to make sure, you know, this is, what's this packet yeah. switching stuff? How do we know it's working? We set up a telephone connection. And the irony is we're using the telephone technology to introduce a new te technology. Mm -hmm. He's going to eat technology. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Test it, yep. but, but we could talk to each other. So 
We sent the L and said, you get the L? Yep. Got the L. Sent the O, you get the O? Yep. Got the O. Sent the G, you get the G? Crash. The system went down. So finally, the answer to the question is, the first message ever on the internet was low. Mm -hmm. And a little later, I add, I embellished that a bit to say it's lo and behold. There you go. We couldn't have asked for more prophetic, more profound, more succinct message, mm -hmm. lo and behold, inadvertently. But we didn't have a camera. We didn't have mm -hmm. a voice recorder. The only record is the thing I showed you a moment ago, that entry in the log. Mm -hmm. And you were just as excited about it. You didn't focus on, oh, it crashed after LO, right? I mean, a lot of students today get so caught up in expecting, you know, they try something and they expect it to either be 100% working and they don't understand that making this small step that you just did was so impactful. So how did you feel at that moment? Were you really excited about it? No. <laughs> Why is this advancing on its own, by the way? I don't. Um, no, we were not excited at all. We were just doing a little test of the mm -hmm. first two nodes. The test was very important because it was demonstrating the way in which a network should be used. Sit at one mm -hmm. site, log on to another, and lack mm -hmm. like a local user there. So we was testing the functionality very well. Mm -hmm. But the, uh, there were only you know a couple of us in the room. Why is this advancing on its own? I don't know. I don't know. Uh, I can't go backwards either. Let me go back yeah. to you. Let me see if I can go back. Come on, restart here. Let me, I just pushed it to the other. Just, let me see. Okay, just leave it there. At any rate, you know, it was it was a job. In an hour, by the way, we fixed that uh, crash. The crash happened mm -hmm. on SRI's computer, by the way. Mm -hmm. Went home, went to sleep. Um, we knew it was important, but we were nerds doing our job, solving engineering problems. I mean, was there a vision as to what this would be? The answer is yes. Mm -hmm. uh, I can spend some time talking about that if you like. But mm -hmm. as engineers, we're making step-by-step -step improvements and development. So it was, did not seem to be a momentous day at all. I mean, we would have taken a picture, right? <laughs> <laughs> That's true. That's true. So let, let, let you talked about you know what you had a vision for it. Let's talk a little about that vision, but let's also talk about, you know, yeah, you have some sayings about the Internet now being its teenager years and how sometimes, it, like teenagers, they're mischievous and naughty. Can you talk a little bit about that and how, you know, just a little bit how you came up with that analogy and why you think that? Okay, so, you know, in the early days of the Internet, I tried to tell you it was a wonderful culture where we had lots of resources, lots of brilliant people with a kind of golden era. Out of that era, by the way, came not only networking, time sharing, graphics, mm -hmm. artificial intelligence, high performance computing, chip technology. It was a golden era of collaboration among people, all of whom knew each other. Mm -hmm. And the, the, the nouns we used in those days were words like ethics, free, shared, open, trusted, we were a wonderfully close-knit community people. Um, and that was the situation for a good 25 years. However, in the late, late 80s, when we had a gigabit, gigabit backbone, when we had the dot-coms begin to take an interest because mm -hmm. they saw email moving around and the companies mm -hmm. wanted it, um, things worked pretty well. And I'm going to show you a little bit of a history here. Um, from 1969, when we started and had a little four node network, you see the first two up there as well, mm -hmm. till 1988, when it began to get big toward the end of the eighties, this network just, it grew rapidly, friendly, broadly until 1988, Robert Morris unleashed the first internet worm. And it went through a large number of machines and made some trouble. But it seemed to be a nuisance, seemed to be hacking around. And we began to see uh, nuisance things. Um, and we said, uh-oh, something's happening. And then we said, oh, well, just an aberration, a graduate student. This too will pass. From 88 to 94, it continued to grow. Dot-coms came online, as I said, gigabit speeds, web appeared. Until 1994, two lawyers introduced spam. And we said, uh-oh. And this time we said, ouch. 
<laughs> this one hurt because it went to every site on the network. Wow. And it appeared as an advertisement, mm -hmm. a commercial advertisement on our research network, mm -hmm. not allowed. Mm -hmm. So we sent messages back to them, email. We said, you can't do that. Shame on you. Stop. How dare you? Mm -hmm. We sent so much email back to them that we took down their server. So an unintended consequence <laughs> of the first spam was the first mm -hmm. denial of service back. Mm -hmm. wow. But in that period, we felt that these kinds of invasions were hackers, just nuisance things, mm -hmm. you know, please get away. And at that time, and a few years later, I kept feeling, oh, it's just a teenager going through its teenage years, as you said, acting mischievously, disobedient, and it'll eventually mature into a full-fledged adult. Well, I can go on to a long story and point out that's not happened. Mm -hmm. And if you want, mm -hmm. we can get into that. But I'd like to show you what that message was. That first spam came out in April 94, two Arizona lawyers. They were the most hated people on the internet. They were green card lawyers who basically mm -hmm. did the massive mailing. And has anybody in this audience ever seen the first spam email? Because if you haven't, oh, wow. there it is. There it is. It was, it was on April 12th, 1994. Mm -hmm. Basically they said there is a green card lottery taking place, come to us, We'll help you get on the green card lottery, hire mm -hmm. us, pay us. In other words, a commercial advertisement on our, on our email, on our internet. And it was outrageous. But that was the beginning of the end because the dark side came in as a result. Mm -hmm. We began to see a lot more happen. At the time, there was no legal, uh, there was no, no internet laws or legal stuff either. So the, the, the judicial system wasn't even thinking about this, were they? You're exactly right, Karen. They were not, there was an unwritten rule. This was a research network mm -hmm. and not to be used for commercial purposes. Mm -hmm. And the ethics of the environment basically reacted to this. But the cat was out of the bag now. Mm -hmm. A lot of people were on the net through the, through the web. And they said, oh, this is not a research system. Mm -hmm. This is a shopping mall. This is a uh, gossip chamber. This is an entertainment chamber. It's a money-making machine. Money and at machine. that point, and it, it took a serious turn to the dark side, to where we are today with not only mm -hmm. full of spam and advertisements, but more serious things like uh, nation states hacking, like organized mm -hmm. crime, like extremists. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. Sorry about that. Wow, sorry. Too much technology in this environment. <laughs> Here we go. Information okay. over. So, so I I'm guess sorry. the question, I was going to say, one of the questions is now looking at the way things have done with the dark web and how it's been abused, looking back on it, if you knew then what you know now, would you have put in security in the infrastructure and prevented Absolutely. it from a broad access for everyone, equal access to everyone? Well, you raised two interesting points. The answer to the first question is, by all means, we should have, but we didn't. And I already w explained why we didn't. We were all friendly. Mm -hmm. I knew everybody on the internet. We were well behaved. And so we didn't imagine it would reach out to the world's population where you don't know who you're going to find out there. Mm -hmm. And had we done that, we should have put in a, at least two capabilities. And it would not have been very hard in those early days because it was a clean slate. There were no systems we had to basically backward compatible to. One of them is we should have put in strong file authentication, which means if I send you a file, we can prove that what I sent you is what you received. It's not mm -hmm. been changed and not been replaced, etc. Mm -hmm. Second thing we should have put in is strong user authentication. Mm -hmm. So if you and I communicate, you can prove it's you. And I can mm -hmm. be reassured it's you and not some man in the middle. Mm -hmm. And then we should have turned that capability off because we didn't need it in those early days. Mm -hmm. And as we needed it, we should have turned it on slowly. But even with those two, it wouldn't have been sufficient to prevent much of the problems we have today. It would have slowed it down. That would have been helpful. But, and the, uh, the fact, you know, the power of the Internet as it rolled out mm -hmm. is the following. Anybody with a computer and an Internet link 
can reach out to millions of people at almost no cost in time or effort immediately mm-hmm. and anonymously. Mm-hmm. So, perfect formula for the dark side. Mm-hmm. A bad mm-hmm. player can do the same thing easily and infect us. Mm-hmm. And so the thing which enabled the internet is also the thing which has caused some of these serious problems. Right. And today's engineers, young engineers that are studying, you know, we, we learn how to design things to work for the specification it was intended for. And now young engineers have to also think about unintended uses and how is it somebody going to think, you know, misuse this and how do I protect that? I think that's a whole new dimension in the education realm that we have to look at. So with that, tell me about your new lab, which congratulations on. We want to hear about what kind of problems are you be looking in this new lab of yours? Well, thank you for that comment about the educational aspect. We have to fix and foresight early on. As engineers, as an engineer, you know, I took almost no humanities courses. You know, there's plenty of engineering courses I had to get through. We should have had more, and nowadays it's coming. There are ethics courses. You have to think about Mm -hmm. the implication of what your technology and innovations might become. Mm -hmm. And and try to, and I think the UK have that viewpoint. It's embedded in their thinking and the Mm -hmm. social implications of responsibility, but it's important. Mm -hmm. Now, this new lab I have, it's called the UCLA Connection Lab. It's a laboratory we set up at UCLA. It's a beautiful lab. In fact, I can show you in just a moment. It, um, it has a driving thing. The thing is, it's being involved with connectivity. Mm-hmm. And it includes things like networking, like wireless, like protocols, like blockchain, like, uh, for example, uh, cryptography, like d- distributed control, um, uh, all these all these systems that have connectivity involved. And we're doing lots of research in all those areas. It's a laboratory. It's a beautiful laboratory. You wouldn't think it's an engineering lab. It's it's designed mm-hmm. by one of the world's best architects. It's, it's just a, you know, not, a not set of rooms. Thing, that you not in a windowless basement anymore. <laughs> Exactly. Exactly. It's meant to encourage interaction, collaboration. Mm-hmm. It's got a 32 foot by 10 foot tall whiteboard, glass whiteboard, which everybody can engage in and put their mm-hmm. scribbly notes on. Mm-hmm. Um, in fact, I can probably bring up a picture of it here if I can get to it. But uh, the idea is to bring in research students, graduate and undergraduate. Mm-hmm who work on the problems that they choose. They're not told what to work on. They basically generate their own concepts and they collaborate. It's interdisciplinary. It brings in faculty, visitors, postdocs. And it's, uh, it's, it's closed right now because of the pandemic, but it's a place that they love to come and it's, it's forward looking and it's reaching out well beyond UCLA to internationally and domestically to other Groups, blockchain groups, research groups, etc. Um, are you? Are you? So, if you think about looking three to five years in the future, like in your lab, do you see AI being there? Do you see quantum computing being there? Well, what What do you see in the future? What do you see coming up? Yes, yes. I like to point out three areas of of technology which are appearing in the public, which the public has no idea about. Mm-hmm. And someone needs to write a good, to simple paper, an accurate paper, but one that can be read by the, by the consumer. The mm-hmm. three areas I think of are CRISPR, oh, people are this. confused, yeah. quantum, yeah. and blockchain. And blockchain, yeah. it, It's in the news all the time. People are confused about it. And a good, mm-hmm. But those are the areas I think are moving forward. But Mm -hmm. I mentioned CRISPR because I believe that the whole area of bioengineering, uh, neuroengineering, um, neural networks, which sort of enter into the field, they're trying to mimic the Mm -hmm. way the brain learns. That whole area is fascinating and just open with wonderful problems that have yet to be solved. It's Mm -hmm. a very rich area. In fact, if I was a young student now, I'd probably go into a bioengineering mix. Mm -hmm. I think that's where many of the opportunities are. There's plenty left in the internet world, of course. Huge numbers of problems. Right. But that but right, mix I find. 
just because we are IEEE and we have lots of biomed engineers, a lot of engineers, even if they're in electrical or computer, are doing biomedical types of things. So CRISPR and Prime, those are really um, great yeah. areas. But in using AI for that is going to be instrumental. Is that, I mean, do you believe AI is going to be huge in the future? Absolutely. You know, the AI was started when I was a student at MIT by Marvin Minsky mm -hmm. and, and John McCarthy. Mm -hmm. And they were playing around with all kinds of wonderful systems, clunky systems. Neural networks were being studied there. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, for 20 years, the neural network world uh, was killed mm -hmm. because it, they, they argued it, it can't function until finally we got the, the, uh, the deeper networks and the capability to do some heavy computation. Neural networks are fascinating, but there's a problem with them. And the problem with them is they don't explain what they're doing. That's right. They'll do a great job of recognizing Facebook. And if they don't recognize what they're doing, that's fine for some applications, but they can't tell you what's happening. So imagine if you gave the United States economy over to a, an artificial intelligence neural network, and it's doing fine. Mm -hmm. And it may be optimized for the economy. Well, you know, any optimized system, I'm sure the entire audience understands it, any well-optimized system behaves beautifully in the, which it was designed. Mm -hmm. If you exceed the domain, it'll mm -hmm. crash. Mm -hmm. And it'll crash colossally. Mm -hmm. A good example is, I like to use AM radio versus FM radio. Mm -hmm. Now, AM radio is always lousy. And the further you go from the base station, the lousier it gets. FM is terrific, clean, sharp, and it works well until you suddenly get outside its range and it collapses, starts sputtering, mm -hmm. chopping, and down it goes. Mm -hmm. And you may not know when you're near the edge of the domain. Mm -hmm. Well, if a neural network can't tell you what it's doing and why it's doing it, and you've optimized it somehow, and you give it the economy, and it decides to do something irrational, you may not know until it's too late. Mm -hmm. um, and there are many examples of where that happens with optimized systems. So, you know, it's, it's more than just building a little device that works in, in the domain you design it for. Mm -hmm. You've got to think more broadly. Where might it go? Where, how might it be abused? Mm -hmm. uh, there's wonderful control problems, flow control problems that need to be addressed here. Wow. But they're great. Yeah, well, that's the thing, you know, I think everybody's looking for a definition of AI, and my definition is that it allows us to explore, explain, and expand our capabilities. But if you can't explain what's going on in it, then you really can't, you know, move ahead. And, and also building, you, the, you brought up some principles from way back when about ethics and trust and uh, robustness, and all those principles that you were going for years, 50 years ago, we still need today, which is those guiding principles are really still solid. So I think that, you know, that's been consistent and that's something that I hope our young engineers out there all aspire to. Now, uh, we do have some questions from, um, one of them is from William Kincaid. And what's he say? He says, Len, I too worked on the foundation of the internet. In my case, I worked on what is now DNS. I'm smiling because you are bringing back memories. I'm happy we decided not to have industry, IBM manage DNS, but can you tell us any of the things you would do differently or major changes going forward? Okay, so you've already mentioned one important one. We should have put in some more security and protection, mm -hmm. anticipating that we would be encountering players who were not necessarily kind, but were more malicious and evil. Mm -hmm. um, Exactly, and I mentioned two things we should have put in, but the, the, the fundamental problem is that we didn't put all, any, and now um, any, any new security capability in a region where we can understand how the various parts interact. Mm -hmm. Everybody adds a new capability. DNS is an example. Well, what are the vulnerabilities of DNS? And what if I add access to a cell phone? Um, and it's, it's, it's weak security. How can I make sure it's, it's to withstand some new application or service or, 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 or um, that will interact? So we, we need to understand in a larger way what mm -hmm. security is. And now we're built with, we're facing billions of machines out there. Mm -hmm. That's called a legacy system. 
Mm-hmm. And how do you add any protection to a system mm-hmm. which has such a huge legacy? When we made the internet, we had a clean sheet. It was an easy job. We could do whatever <laughs> we wanted. Right. And by and the I, way, talking about yeah, talking about the it. IBM. Yep, all these sensors are out there too, connecting into networks. That's that makes it even you know intractable. Yep, it, it's that's both a blessing and a curse because mm-hmm. my vision of the internet is to make it invisible, which mm-hmm. all those sensors disappear into the infrastructure. Mm-hmm. Those sensors may well be and are weak in their protection capabilities, mm-hmm. and they can introduce all kinds of faults and disasters, as we know. But I did want to make the point as uh, the question that I asked. It's a good thing that IBM and DEC or Wang were not in control of the internet Mm -hmm. because they did try and of course IP went out. Mm -hmm. Um, It was a grassroots movement which basically won the game as opposed Mm -hmm. to standards imposed from above Mm -hmm. by a single industry or company which then would have controlled, you know, the kinds of equipment, kinds of protocols, Mm -hmm. kinds of communication. So it's, Mm -hmm. it's great that it was not dominated by a single company. It was very important. Right. And I think IEEE, you know, led the forefront in developing standards that helped prevent those types of monopolies on, on you know, just use this equipment or just use this protocol. So, yes, I think that was a, you know, helped um, your, your community was part of IEEE. So I think that that really helped us formulate the, the ethics and those types of standards that we still live by today. So that was awesome. Thank you for all that. So I, I don't see any other questions from our audience. So, Len, we're coming up to our uh, end of our talk, but uh, is there anything you think the audience really needs to know, any advice for young people out there? I mean, you already mentioned those three areas, people, CRISPR, quantum, and blockchain, so there's your next thesis. But what do you think about, is there anything you want to, you know, parting words you want to leave us with? Well, there are so many things I can give, especially to the students out there. Um, Perhaps one thing I'd like to say is that uh, I feel computers are one of the worst enemies of critical thinking. I know that's an outrageous statement. And by that I mean many young researchers these days spend, depend too much on computers to solve the problems for them. It replaces their thinking instead of, uh, and they just do number crunching. Example, mm-hmm. they're using simulation too heavily. I'll give a student a a problem which needs to be modeled and analyzed and then to extract the principles of operation. What they'll do is they'll simulate it accurately, come back to me and and show me Y versus X and look at the behavior. They say, well, that's nice. Why does that line look like a straight line? And what does the slope mean in terms of the underlying parameters? And what if I double the number of nodes? Oh, I'll double the number. Okay, I'll simulate that. And mm-hmm. I say, no, no, you have no idea what's going on. That's right. They, re- they, they depend upon the machine to give them the answers instead of saying, what is the model? What's going on? You know, how do I extract principles of operation? Is bigger better? You know, what happens mm-hmm. if I have a different kind of graph structure, a different kind of protocol? So depending upon computers, it, you know, don't do mindless simulation. Use it mm-hmm. for, you know, particular focus. Another thing is, um, when you choose a problem, just to get it back to something you said, Karen, when you choose a problem, I'm reminded of something that Richard Hamming once asked me. Um, he's the Hamming code, et cetera, that had him mm-hmm. uh, transform. He said, why is it that so few people do important work in their research? And he says, the answer is because they don't try to work on important problems. Mm-hmm. They don't look at things which will have impact. And you should take the following viewpoint. Will your work be remembered a thousand years from now? Mm-hmm. Well, that's a bit much. But it's interesting to ask yourself, what do you remember about work a thousand years ago? Mm-hmm. How many things are important today from that long ago? Uh, maybe a thousand. How about a hundred years? Mm-hmm. How about ten years? Mm-hmm. Are you working on something which will be remembered and important ten years from now? Mm-hmm. Two years from now, but not three weeks. Right. So the idea of looking at the impact of your work, it's it, it, it's a wonderful, it's 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 an almost like a wonderful narcotic. You work on something mm-hmm. that's really got you excited, and you want you want to work on it. Um, 
One other thing I'll, I'll mention, it, it's in the form of a joke, but it has a very important model. It's the following. One day, this elderly gentleman goes to the ball game. He sits in the bleachers and he's watching the game. And sitting next to him is a, a youthful young person watching with him. Um, and every so often, the young man looks at the elderly man. And finally, he says, excuse me, sir. I'm looking at you, and I realize you and I have nothing in common. We don't speak the same language. I mean, when you were around, there was certainly no smartphones, no social networks, uh, probably no internet, um, you know, no time sharing, no big computers. I can't relate to you. So the old man says, you know, son, you're right. We didn't have those things. So we had to invent them. What the hell are you going to do for the next generation? And the point is not to be uh, nasty about it, but to point mm -hmm. out, you've got to look at the past and understand mm -hmm. these things were put together by generations of innovative people. You are now that generation, mm -hmm. but you can't ignore what happened in the past. You don't need to recreate everything. People don't go back and look at the, what happened in the past. And the uh, the um, need to think in an innovative way, recognizing what's been going on in the past, mm -hmm. is critical. And related to that, as a professor, we lie to our students. You do. Student comes into the class. <laughs> we do. At all grades, from you know K through twelve, mm -hmm. we hand our young people the jewels of 4,000 years of knowledge. Mm -hmm. Here's Maxwell's equations. Here's the Mona Lisa. You know, here's Newton's equations. Here it is. And they get handed them, you know, in, in a one-day, two-day lecture. And it looks as if the work was very easy, mm -hmm. that the frontier is trivial to break through. Mm -hmm. What we don't tell them is it was really hard. Mm -hmm. These people made mistakes. They failed. They had to turn around and restart again. So we give them the wrong impression. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, so when our students go out there and try to do something new and they mm -hmm. bump against the frontier and they get stopped mm -hmm. and they say, oh, my God, I'm a failure. Oh, yeah. oh, those, those greats went through the same thing. You can mm -hmm. punch through. Just keep at mm -hmm. it. And keep that, and that's and that's true. Failure is part of the, the, is part of the, 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 the path, and we have to yeah. get used to it. So you're absolutely right. So I, I, I do tell my students that failure is good. So they don't believe me because they're grade centric, but that we'll, we'll get them there eventually. So, um, it, you know, it, I guess one parting question is just how can I truly help young engineers take these risks in their careers? How, how do we how do how do we like what advice for us professors other than tell them they can fail? How do we help young students? And especially like it for HKN, because we are identifying the most promising uh, students that have all that ethics and trustworthiness and, and character and scholarship already built into them that are, are, are forced to do this. How do we help inspire them and what tools can we give them? Well, to help inspire them, I think you can have them look at the very significant works of the past and dig deeper and understand the trials and tribulations that went into getting that work correct, mm -hmm. um, as I said earlier, um, because it's, it's, it's not taught that way now. You know, a professor wants to present perfect material with all the, you know, the equations exact. It's not the case. And go to some of those people and have them talk about their failures. Mm -hmm. I think that's a great experience. I got plenty I can go through if you want another hour. <laughs> you know, it'll be embarrassing. But but it's important, you know. Not, nothing is smooth. Um, the, the there's plenty of places where you 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 hit a fork in the road, and you got to choose which way. By the way, another lesson is to to the students again is to make sure that all the work that you do that you do it well. Don't be sloppy. Mm -hmm. Don't rush through it. Don't uh, patch it. Mm -hmm. Do it well because you never know that what you're doing could be very significant and it's gonna have a big impact and it's gotta be done right. And the pleasure and the, the gratification you get in doing things carefully and right, even a failure, as we pointed mm -hmm. out. If you you look at the steps, you understand what was wrong, you learn from it. 
And most of all, it's building confidence in these youngest that they can achieve. That's really important because they get discouraged very easily when they bump into our problems. Awesome. Um, it's, that's, that's it's, amazing. There's plenty of lessons. Oh, that's amazing. And I think that we can all take that away. We've all learned something so much. And we're so grateful for you being with us here today. So for our audience, we want to thank Dr. Leonard Kleinrock uh, um, for being with us today on our HKN event. And I want to thank all of you for participating. And Dr. Kleinrock, we can't wait to see all the great things that come out of your lab. And I hope to see some of our HKN students actually go into that lab and making impact on our future. So thank you so much. Thank you, everyone. Have a great day. And again, keep in touch with us at HKM. We have a great program and other things that you can get involved in. So help us engage, and we'll help you. So thank you. Bye, everybody. Hey, Karen, um, thank you, Len. You know, Len was inducted in the Eta Kappa Mu. What year was that, Len? CCNY? I would guess it was probably, probably 1959 or so. <laughs> so for all of you that are Eta Kappa Mu students today, this is uh, this is you in the future, and uh, the Eta Kappa Mu Network is there for you. So again, thank you, Karen. Thank you, Dr. Kleinrock. Thanks for always answering my call when I uh, reach out to you. I know you're always willing to help students and help the HKN.